The incredible story of Washington State terroir began some 20,000 years ago, near the end of Earth's last great ice age, with a series of cataclysmic events. The largest known floods in Earth's history unleashed violent forces of water, creating the rugged beauty of Washington State. During this glacial advance, a huge glacier pushed south along the Purcell Trench near present-day Lake Ponderay, Idaho damming the Clark Fork River. Amidst the steep mountains of northern Idaho, the Clark Fork River winds its way westward towards the Pacific Ocean. The river backed up behind the 2,000-foot-high ice dam, filling the valleys to the east almost to the Continental Divide, creating Glacial Lake Missoula. 19,000 years ago, uh, the ice dam just cataclysmically failed and that was blown away and just swept away in an instant, letting that 500 cubic miles of water begin its travel to the Pacific Ocean. Flowing 60 or 70 miles an hour with icebergs, chunks of the failed glacier swept along in the water, chunks of glacial ice that we can only imagine as being maybe up to a quarter of a mile or even more in diameter, carrying hundreds of tons of huge boulders. On the raging 430-mile journey to the Pacific Ocean, the floodwaters obliterated everything in their path and forever altered the landscape. All vegetation and topsoil was stripped from the valleys and mountainsides. Bedrock was picked apart and pulverized. An immense channel system was carved across eastern Washington, leaving great scars of black rock known as scabland that remains barren to this day. When the floods encountered Wallula Gap, they slowed briefly and formed the gigantic but temporary Lake Lewis. At its fullest, Lewis was 800 feet deep and filled the Yakima River Valley to the current side of Yakima, the entire Walla Walla Valley to the Blue Mountains, and the Snake River to its junction with the Salmon River. Vast as it was, Lake Lewis existed mere days before the floods cleared the gap and rushed onward, widening and deepening the Columbia River Gorge 140 miles downstream. But in those few hours, massive amounts of alluvial deposits precipitated from the floodwaters, literally laying the foundation for the deep, well-drained, less soils of the Columbia, Yakima, and Walla Walla Valleys, where Vitus vinifera thrive. The Purcell Glacier that came down into this area uh, just happened to um, uh, come into a place where there was a side valley like the Clark Fork with such an important volume of water that it drains from western Montana. And, uh, and the most important point where, where a glacier blocked a river valley was right here where we're, where we're sitting today. Once the glacier was destroyed once, then it only took about 30 to 50 years for the glacier to push its way back into this valley each time and, and fill up the lake. And so over a period of 4,000 years, the glacier reblocked the valley and the lake reformed and filled up. The ice dam was destroyed and the lake was emptied in that process of blockage, filling the lake, destroying the ice dam, and the floods generated uh, maybe as many as 100 times. It's still so fantastic that it's hard to even wrap your brain around. When the ice dam burst and that and huge amounts of that sediment were swept away, it was carried by water, and then, then it was laid down in the Walla Walla Valley uh, by the waters of Lake Missoula. And then in the 10 or 15,000 years since the end of the last ice age, those glacial that glacial rock flower has been picked up and moved by the wind and formed into the lust soils that we have wind as a factor in our northwest geology and our northwest climate has been so important in picking up and eroding and carrying dust clouds, carrying sand sheets out uh, around the area so that we have soils which oftentimes have flood materials in the lower part of the rooting zone and windblown materials over the top. We often have stratified or layered soils. We have uh, all of these uh, agricultural areas, all of the wine grape areas, and we have uh, our our world-class uh, wine grape industry here in the state because of the Ice Age events, the floods, and then the winds. The 
Cascade Mountain Range divides Washington from north to south. The two sides of the state differ in soil types and climate, but have certain similarities. Both regions have mild climates, since even eastern Washington enjoys some cooling influence from the Pacific. Both have the well-drained soils essential for successful viticulture, while the east side gets warm enough in summer to ripen warm climate grapes such as Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah, the west side can nurture cool climate grapes. Born of the confluence of the elemental forces, air, water, earth, and fire, the soils of the Washington wine country have no equivalent in the entire world. Casual observers often note that Washington wine country lies at the same latitude as the famed French wine growing regions of Bordeaux and Burgundy. The hours of daylight are therefore similar to Central Europe. So, what is the most significant difference among these terroirs? Washington has this beautiful color due to those anthocyanins. It's got that vibrancy of fruit and that dense, compact tannins and structures that give our wines this backbone and that streak of minerality that one finds in the Washington wines. Then when we head across the Atlantic and we get to France, very different, even though we're still with Cabernet, but what we get there is we don't get a fruit-forward wine. We get a wine that is restrained with a lot of minerality and earthiness. A lot of people call that terroir-driven, although I definitely think we have terroir-driven wines here in Washington. So terroir is one of those concepts that it's really hard to get your mind around. What does that word mean? Well, it's a combination of all things. It's a combination of the soil, of the climate, of the topography, but it also has to have the human element in it. What makes the wine the way it is? So how I look at terroir is a wine is unique from its very place. So Washington wines definitely have that sense of terroir. These wines, the way they are, the color, the aromas, that vibrancy of fruit cannot be found anywhere else in the world. And I find that very exciting. Eastern Washington is high desert, so we have very warm days, which give us a lot of sugar and which are, is important for the grape quality. But it also then has these cool nights. What happens in the cool nights is we get a retention of acidity. Acidity is part of the balance and it gives you freshness in the wine. And it gives you this vibrancy of fruit that you find. You also get small berries. And small berries are important because that's where the color hangs out. And it's in the skin. And so we want not a lot of pulp in ratio to the skin. So what this gives us is it gives us this beautiful, intense color that we find in Washington wines. The composition of the fruit becomes more complex when the vines are grown in well-drained soils and get scant water. Many parts of Washington, east and west, meet these basic requirements, but beyond that, the ways in which these areas diverge tell us much about the types of wine that they are capable of producing. It is this variety in growing conditions that makes the story of Washington wine country so exciting. You better take advantage of today.